Hello everyone, welcome to Exploring Media Theory Week 9. This week we're going to be looking at the idea of post-capitalism and network theory. And this of course is the pre-recorded lecture. So the aims of this lecture are to outline some of the ideas and concepts that are used to theorise post-capitalism. We're going to be drawing upon uh, a bit of Marxist theory and looking at two thinkers who relate to digital media technologies and the emergence of an oppositional politics and post-capitalism. We're going to critically evaluate some of the theories of post-capitalism and compare and contrast post-capitalism with some of the other theoretical approaches. We'll probably do more of that one in the seminar. Okay, so I want to really to look today at two main thinkers. Um, they're quite distinct and quite important in their own ways. The first of which is a, a gentleman called Professor Manuel Castells. He's a Spanish academic who's published extensively on capitalism. He's been writing about these topics since really the mid-1990s. Um, he's done a, a very significant series of books on what he termed network society. Uh, he now lives and works in the US. Uh, second theorist we're going to look at is someone called Paul Mason, who's a journalist and polemicist He's a left-wing commentator. Uh, he often appears on BBC Newsnight. He writes for The Guardian and other sources. And he writes about capitalism, and he draws quite heavily upon Castells' work as well. But he advances a number of Castells' ideas in new directions. And he makes them quite understandable and quite useful. He also draws quite heavily on some Marxist theory uh, to interrogate certain economics. He's got a very good understanding of economics. Um, he was a former editor for the BBC, so he's got a lot of understanding there, and he brings things together, he presents them in quite a nice way. So let's just look at some of the books. So Castell's right, Rise to Rise and Network Society and a number of other editions. He did three volumes of this one. Um, you've got another one there on one of his more recent works, so Networks of Outrage and Hope, and then we've got two texts by Paul Mason. First of all, why it's kicking off everywhere and new global revolutions and post-capitalism, a guide to the future. Okay, so I want to first turn to the work of Manuel Castells. Uh, Castells uses what, uh, a branch of sociological theory called network theory to understand how power operates in society. So Castells is a sociologist that looks at digital networks and looks at contemporary societies in the late modern world and he uses what he called network theory to try and understand these societies. And what he argues is that from the 1970s onwards, many organisations such as groups, political parties and other entities such as companies began to be organised not so much in hierarchical structures but through networks. So if you look at organisations such as the Green Movements and even sort of like criminal organisations, they tended not to be, they, they moved away from a shift of having a single chain of command going down to cells or networks of groups. So you would have nodes and links between the nodes. Nodes are the individual people or groups and there would be another group of people over here and they would be connected to them in some way. So it's these networks, these contacts that people have that gave them power. And what he was arguing is there's been a gradual shift from about 1970s onwards a change in maybe to not just management fashion, but the way in which organisations see themselves and see power operating. And so they looked at it, what Castells does. He looked at how different organisations have restructured themselves over the past 40 years. Just as a, as a strange aside, um, a few weeks ago I read an interesting article about the structure of the Italian mob, so like Mafia and Gamora and the Calabrian Mafia. And uh, they've been through a similar shift. They went through a very hierarchical system where you would have a single boss bossing people around in the chain of command. And they shifted across to a network structure where there's individual cells. And they did that to avoid various forms of prosecution. Now that's completely aside from what I'm really talking about here. But you do see different types of organisation shifting how they're structured. Moving away from a hierarchical system to a more distributed system. And what Castells is arguing is this has occurred throughout society. It's not just within certain organisations, it's not just within media companies, but it's in all sorts of groups. Um, and some of the advice we give you 
particularly in the work placement module, make use of your networks. Uh, use the ways in which your parents and your friends and family and other people, brothers and sisters, contacts you make at university, have contacts with other people. So the world is shifting. We're shifting away from thinking of closed groups. We've got a linear chain of command to thinking much more on a network structure. And what Castells does, he uses a lot of these ideas to understand how power operates now. Um, from the 1970s, there was also electronic media where you know, the growth of networks there. The internet was commenced in 1969, it really began in the early 1960s with very sort of like tentative systems. Um, but it was really 1969, the first email was sent, 1973, um, the first interconnection between different computers in different parts of the US very quickly evolved. Now, what Castells is saying is the electronic media, the development of those, it runs parallel and it facilitated uh, a shift in the type of society. It didn't cause it, but that cause is there already. And technology was deployed to further that networking sense. And what Castells argues, he says that networks are flexible and nimble, as opposed to the more fragile and rigid power systems, such as a chain of command. So if you think about how organizations run, if you've got a single chain of command, you've got a manager, a deputy manager, a supervisor, and then a worker, and instruction will come down that chain of command to it. If one of those points is somehow not available, then the chain of command flows. And this is particularly evident in the military. If you take out one person in the military, the chain of command breaks. Network structure offers a different way of doing things. Here people are given tasks and they get on with them in their own right and they make the connections to the other people they need to help them do it. Um, <coughs> so networks are more, are more, fimble, sorry, more nimble. They permit flows of political and economic and social power. Whereas hierarchies tend to be structured just around one. So it might be political power, it might be economic power or it might be social power. But network uh, hierarchies tend to have one system. Whereas networks tend to integrate different forms of power and permit different social networks. So if you think of an economic network that you have, many of you in the work placement module uh, were using other forms of network to find placements. So you're using friends of family. So you're using social connections to leverage economic benefits. A single chain of command won't permit you to do that. A single economic way of looking at things won't permit you to do that. But networks allow us to mix together our different systems to leverage our things to gain benefits. Similarly, you can use your economic benefits. You might meet your life partner through an economic system uh, or through some other forms of social interaction. So looking at things differently, um, as network theory asks us uh, and requires us to do, changes the way in which we understand how power moves around. Now what Castells is arguing is the arrival of computer mediated communication and systems such as the internet has accelerated the network structure and its strength. It's overlaid it with, with actual ways in which different cells and different groups can communicate. Now why the media, while the media uh, was sorry, while the media is vital to power in modernity, was vital to power in modernity, it is the two-way flow and bilateral power of networks that gives the media its real power in late modernity, or what Castells calls network societies. Um, and what he sees them as networks of communication are both horizontal and vertical. We communicate both with our peers and people above us and people of below us. Now in a more traditional media system, such as the old style newspapers, you buy a newspaper and the information comes down to you. What networks do is allow us to go across and to share information across peer networks. Um, so information flows horizontally as well as vertically. And what Castells argues is that networks reveal both the power of flows but also the flow of power. You can see power flowing across networks and how it integrates and uh, rearticulates relationships in those networks. So digital networks, uh, were, when they first came out, they were initially heralded by 
cyber, what we term cyber utopians, people that like uh, the distribution of uh, computers in society and people that advocated that we should have more computers and didn't see any downside to it. Well, when computers first came out, everyone was sort of like, you know, thought, oh, this is going to re-empower civic society. Um, and in the age of the internet, the uh, prediction was that everyone will have a voice. The citizen will be empowered. There will be citizen journalists everywhere recording news, uploading it, and this will challenge the power elites. Um, and that was very much uh, a kind of thought we had about network society and about the future in the sort of like mid to late, sort of like from the late 1990s to the mid 2000s. We thought that the new systems of communication were going to liberate people, make them more powerful. But what Castells argues is that networks do not bring equality. Instead, networks permit the flow of power. So power systems that were existent before the networks will just find new ways of exercising that power. Uh, power will still operate. You will still have people of higher social standing than you having power. They will just use the network to do it. And he argues that some network nodes some groups on the network are more important than others, while others function as switches and they route power via new paths and, you know, or cement existing powers. So people who are able to channel information within a network, and I don't just mean sort of like on the internet, but I mean we all know people who are very good at communicating and relate information out. We tend to term those network theories super nodes as people who've got lots of connections. And they can choose the way in which information flows around groups. They can channel information around people and uh, you know, circumvent particular ways. Or they can stop certain pieces of information getting out there. And they can cement and keep going existing power relations. This doesn't just work in the metaphor of actual people, but it works in uh, actual hard networks as well. In various forms of information, uh, uh, various forms of node are used to control how information flows through networks. I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, well, we've got these new works. Are they going to transform capitalism into something else? Now, Castells is a bit ambivalent about this. He's not quite sure yes or no. Um, but he does offer the grounds of hope. If you want to have a look at that, have a look at the um, Fitzpatrick reading. Excuse me, I just need a sip of my coffee here. Sorry, I've still got this dreadful cold, so I have to have a drink this often. Anyway, to so office grounds of hope. There is a picture of Manuel, and there's a couple of quotes. The power, sorry, the media are not the holders of power, but they constitute the space where power is decided. And CMC allows for computer mediated communication, allows for mass self communication, socialised communication enacted via horizontal digital networks. So in recent times, in most societies, digital media have played a key part, a key political role, and it becomes the space where politics has begun to be enacted. So politics takes place in all sorts of things. It takes place in offices, it takes place in classrooms, in social spaces. Traditionally, we used to think politics should take place in maybe a town square. That's where we would come together to have debates about topics, to educate ourselves, to learn about things. And for many years, we thought of the media as a new space for politics. Uh, the, the role of the media was to offer a place where we, which we could debate and learn about politics and learn about political issues. And what's happened in the network society is that space has moved away from the more traditional media into new places. Um, so we've now got online forums where we can debate and discuss things. So mainstream parties compete for centre ground. So they use spin doctors media advisors and image consultants to shift public opinion around. But when you've got mass self-communication, um, this kind of changes the power of the spin doctors and those people that shift public opinion and gives us back power. This is the kind of positive view on it. So we've got horizontal power flows, people communicating with people which counter the power of corporate groups. So it's not just subject to the PR of corporate organisations, people talking to each other, people sharing stories on Facebook, people setting up Facebook groups and Twitter accounts to share information across. Um, 
allow us to challenge some of the corporate power. So there have been examples in a number of years. There's been various uh, protests held outside Vodafone shops because of their tax avoidance systems. There was the whole Occupy movement, which is a large uh, movement that began around 2009 to challenge corporate greed, and they used social media to organise protests, uh, to appear at certain times, and to take over sites of well, large capitalism. So they turned up in the city of London, and they camped outside St Paul's Cathedral, right where the financial traders were, and they set up these tent cities, and various things like this. So they were organising online, but being active offline. And they set up what we might term pop-up politics, the use of social media to organise and resist corporate power. Um, however, of course, corporate power doesn't sit back and be beaten. So um, civic ordinary counterpower can be exerted through digital networks. So network actors were challenging the powerful organisations online. So people were posting things on Facebook. When you're a corporate Facebook group page, you, you, you find often people uh, challenge that and they put stories about why the product isn't working very well. However, in spite of the rise of social movements and the loss of the legitimacy of conventional politics, uh, established power networks resist their loss of power and they find why it find ways to fight back. So let me recap a little bit. So you've got corporate power, people use social networks to challenge corporate power, but then corporate power finds new ways in which to challenge people's groups again. So you found the media presence in social networks. You found uh, corporate sites in social networking events. Uh, you found company Facebook pages. They also use social networks to promote their position and argument. So you end up with various struggles over what we term net neutrality. Net neutrality is, does all data have the same standing on networks? Or can corporations pay to have their data prioritised over thinner data pipes? So if you want to get information from one place to another on the internet, currently everything is equal, everything is neutral. The net is neutral itself. What we're moving towards a state where companies can pay extra to have their data taken priority. So if you pay for an account with Netflix, you'll get the information quicker than if you use, I don't know, some kind of peer-to-peer -peer sharing site. But that's just not for us. I mean, that's all sorts of data will be shared across things. So you'll find that the limited network resources, the pipelines, the things that permit our broadband communication um, will start to prioritise more corporate systems rather than, say, university systems or other people's ways of communicating. You also get things such as Google bombing and washing. So if you find your organisation has been hammered in the press and if you type in the company brand, lots of bad stories come up on Google. Well, there's organisations out there that can help you clean up your online presence. It's a bit like PR. But what they do, they put more positive stories and they constantly push up the positive stories. And gradually, the negative stories drop down the list. So they wash the internet, as it were, with positive stories about corporations to limit the amount of bad stories that appear in Google. And you also get the incidents of fake news, um, not just in elections, but in all sorts of things. Positive stories sold about corporations, about sold about individual new politicians and all sorts of things. So fake news is kind of like another aspect of it. So these corporations will try to occupy the horizontal lines of mediation. So whereas before social media were used to challenge corporations, corporations have now got inside social media and are penetrating the lines themselves and using the same systems that they've done for years, but to do it in a new way. Okay, I want to turn now to uh, Paul Mason um, and his ideas of post-capitalism. Uh, Paul Mason was the economics editor at Channel 4 News. Uh, his key influences are network theory, drawing from Manuel Castell, some stuff we just talked about, and Marxist theory. His two most recent books were Why, why Is It All Kick? Why It's Kicking Off Everywhere, published in 2012, and Post-Capitalism, A Guide to Our Future. 2015. Very readable, very worth reading, so please do have a look. If you want a Christmas present, I recommend you ask Santa for uh, post-capitalism. 
It's entertaining really. Okay, so his key idea is about profits and loss. And I want to try and use a bit of a weird metaphor to explain this one. So Mason uses <coughs> Marx to analyse digital technologies and information capitalism. Let's give me a sec. Saying information technology capitalism because of the cough balls. Okay, so Mason uses Marx to analyse digital technologies and information technology capitalism. Um, Marx did not write a great deal about technology, um, but he did write one piece, and it was lost, unfortunately, until 1922, when the fragment on machines was discovered in an archive, and that's now published in his text, The Grundis. Now, Marx argues, and I'm going to paraphrase Marx and massively simplify it uh, for the purposes of brevity here, and I do apologise for giving quite a reductionist and limited interpretation here. Yes. So Marx argues that capitalism generates a profit when its workers are paid, when it paid workers less than the value of their output. So this is the, the idea of surplus value. And we covered this a few weeks ago in the lecture on political economic Marxism. So to give you a, a really, really crude note, I apologise for the simplicity of this thing. So say I run a shirt manufacturer. I didn't make this shirt. I think I got this one from Matlab. Um, but say I work, a, I run a shirt manufacturer and I hire a worker to help me do that. So over the week, um, my worker makes 50 shirts and I charge customers £10 per shirt. And I sell them in my shop where my little workshop is. And my shop makes £500 a week and I pay my worker £300 and I keep the £200 of surplus value. So surplus value is the difference between the amount of money I make from my worker's labour and the amount of money I actually pay my worker. That's termed surplus value. And every job has a surplus value. The amount of money you bring to an organisation is less than the amount of money they pay you. If you bring less value than you're earning, so if you bring less value than you're earning, then the company loses out. So you've always got to bring more value to an organisation than what they're paying you. So they keep that bit of extra money. That's their surplus value. And I use that to pay for the shop, for the equipment, the supplies, and I keep it for myself. And the more people I employ making those £200, the more profit, the more value I get from it. So soon, I don't have to do any work. I just employ people and use the money that they make to pay them and keep the rest for myself. That's the basic idea of Marx's stuff, the idea of surplus value. Now, profit comes from the labour of live workers, of people doing the work. That's called direct labour. However, Marx also sees another form of labour in the development of skills, techniques and machinery which are deployed at one remove from their original creation. So let me explain this one. We've go back to my uh, bit of daft shop metaphor again. So say I've got my worker working in the shop and I think, mm, I want him to work a bit harder. I know, I'll buy him a new pair of wonderful scissors. So I go out and I buy him a new pair of scissors, say £15. I buy my scissors, buy my tailor a new pair of super scissors to make shirts a bit quicker. These cut a bit sharper, they cut a bit quicker. So he's now able to make 11 shirts a day rather than 10. So at the end of the week, he makes 55. So my profit increases. I'm actually able to make another £50 profit. But I don't pay my worker any extra money. Now I might give him a little bit of a pay rise. The labour producing the extra shirts is understood to be stored in the scissors. It's the scissors that have led to the increase in productivity. And it's the techniques that my labour, my workers used. So it is the scissors manufacturer's labour that I have bought. So the people who are making the scissors is now stored, their labour is now stored in the scissors. And I bought those scissors. Now I paid once for the scissors, but the scissors keep working. Every week they're able to make five extra shirts. It's brilliant. And as manufacturing became automated and automised during the Industrial Revolution, Marx could see that the proportion of indirect labour, stuff stored in machine that was made by somebody else that you buy and use, was growing hugely. And we're not just talking about scissors, we're talking about sewing machines, automated cutters, mills, the whole thing's are factories. 
They are what Marx terms indirect labour, machines that store the labour of the people that made them and that allow it to be repurposed and reused by somebody else to make things quicker and faster. So the cotton spinning machine replaced many live workers with technology and the technology represented the indirect labour of those who made the spinning machines. And you see this argument occurring time and time again now. There's lots of people are saying in 20 years time the world will change, increasing robotics will have shifted the ways in which we work manufacturing and all sorts of areas. So Marx saw the techniques, deployment, plans and management systems to improve manufacturing as what he termed as a general intellect, an idea of socialised knowledge. So it's information, an expert system, an expert body of knowledge, as well as the equipment. And that becomes increasingly important in manufacturers. So to give you a modern example, software developers who work for particular companies, but draw on coding and software development that have been produced by many others, um, and often available for free via uh, shareware, um, like open source, do the same thing. So they're able to work on stuff and produce things by drawing on the work of others. It's not just their labour anymore, they're bringing the intellectual capital from other people's labour and applying it. Now, Marx could see technology becoming ever more important. Factory machines, telegraph, steam power, all sorts of things were, were springing up during his lifetime. But with an increased supply of goods, and also other manufacturers entering the market, the reseller value of my shirts goes down. So I've got this guy, he's making it, whereas before he was making 50 shirts a week and we were selling them. Now he's suddenly able to make 55 a week, there's more shirts on the market. But there's also other people coming to the market. Other shirt manufacturers look at my business and say, that's a good idea, and they start doing it as well. And because there's now more shirts on the market, well, they're not selling for £10, they start selling, one of my competitors starts selling his for £9.50 and then £9 and gradually because there's more shirts there and we're able to make them cheaper and quicker the price of the shirt gradually goes down. So capitalists introduced technology to increase productivity and this actually reduced the amount of live direct labour so we need less workers in there. But with more being produced the resale cost falls and it actually reduces the surplus value. So now the profit drops as well. Well, the surplus value gradually diminishes between the cost of it, the cost of my employees, and the thing there. So this is the tendency for the rate of profit to fall in Marx's theory. Capitalists typically have historically got around this problem by finding new markets. Well, if everyone in my town has now bought one of my shirts, I know I'll go to another town and I'll take my shirts outside now, I'll open another shop somewhere else and sell to a new market or maybe even a new country. I'll take my products abroad and sell them on so we, we look for a bigger market. Or simply by, by maybe we'll even produce even more at even a lower cost. Um, so other people start making shirts and sell them for £8.50. So I sell them for £8. So now my poor tailor with his magic scissors, he has to make 62.5 shirts a week so I can make the same amount of money. So he's working harder, producing more, but the profit has not increased. Now, this kind of thing was highlighted by Marx and he says, that, you know, it's a never-ending problem. You, you never solve it. The more productivity you have, the more goods you put on the market, the less things will cost. Now, many orthodox economists didn't like this and regarded it as rubbish and argue we need to increase we need to continually increase productivity. And in fact, uh, this lecture was made on the, what day is it? It's Thursday, the 23rd of November. And just today, um, Philip Hammond, the Chancellor of the Exchequer, has done his budget and has called for more productivity. And again, this is the big thing in British business news. Um, so again, continual pressure to increase productivity. When you increase productivity, we must do this, we must get better trained workforce, so they can do more. And basically the argument is, unless you increase productivity by two or more percent per year, then your company is going to get say, stagnant and go under. You've got to keep increasing it. 
So it's this idea within capitalism that you've constantly got to change and evolve and progress and make more for less cost. Now Mason argues that it applies even more strongly in the age of digital and information technology. <coughs> Mason argues that the contradictions or the inherent bad logic of capitalism are sharper than ever. So it's a bit like you've got this machine um, that's going so fast it's almost designed to break down. It can't possibly do what it's designed to do. So if you look at this kind of weird sum, you've got very high proportions of dead or indirect labour to live labour in digital production. You've got machines do the labour, uh, the software does it. We draw upon all sorts of resources of passive indirect labour in the production of anything digital. Um, and there is no finite limit to digital production. Um, one of the things is when you make something digital, it can be endlessly copied. Uh, this video, I'm going to put it on YouTube, it could be watched, probably going to be watched about five times, now I've said that. But it could be watched innumerable times. I'm not making one like I do in a lecture, by using the resources of, digi of digitality, using the uh, labour of people that made YouTube, using the electricity of the university's resources, using the equipment I've got in my office while I'm making this wonderful video. Uh, I'm able to make something that can be endlessly copied. So an Apple download, a DVD, or the software for an industrial robot can be copied again and again and again for nothing. So what that will result in is the profit margins in information technology will decline, and they'll endlessly decline. They have to decline, they can't do anything else. Because there's so much, it costs nothing to copy the goods. Um, they have very little value. And this, in turn, threatens the price mechanism, which is at the cornerstone of market capitalism. So our form of capitalism it depends on what we call a price mechanism. And a price mechanism is how you determine how much something costs. And it relates to the supply and demand that determine the things. So if you've got very little of something, but there's an awful lot of people want to buy it, then the price rises. until so it gets to a point where only the people who are able to buy it, buy it. Now, as the supply increases, more people are able to buy it, but gradually, once you've sold things to everybody, then the supply gradually decreases, so the price will then drop down. And what you've got in digital things is when there's endless supply, when there's no limit on the amount of copies of Game of Thrones that you can sell, a copy of Game of Thrones ends up costing nothing. So these factors and the kind of capitalist system that we've got, plus the technological system we've got, damages the very capitalism that we have. There's an inherent contradiction going on there. It's not going to work. <coughs> now, corporations don't want to give up on this, so they try to fight these problems. Um, so they do it in various strategies. So one strategy is to establish monopolies. So they are the only manufacturer of a good. And they do this by buying up or driving competitors out of business. So you end up with organisations such as Facebook, Amazon, uh, Apple and Google. And what they do, they become the dominant player in the market. So other competitors don't really get a position in there. Microsoft do the same thing. Now, this is called breaking the market. It's not allowing a market to function as markets were designed to function, where consumers choose the best product at the best price for their interests. And in many countries, it's illegal to take over a monopoly. In fact, you've got lots of various government bodies called monopolies and mergers commissions that look at who owns the companies in the market and make sure that not a single company is the only producer of a good in a particular market. And they stop mergers and they stop acquisitions and things like that. So the companies get fined or broken up if they get too big and too dominant in the market. Or a second strategy companies use um, is by using law and technology to restrict the potential of technology. And you end up in a kind of technological arms race. So back in the early 2000s, we had something called Napster, which allowed people to copy and share uh, music on a peer-to-peer -peer network. And that's the first peer-to-peer -peer network for the spreading of music. So the companies came in and made that illegal. And then they developed various ways in which you could protect music from being copied. But then the hackers and the various cyber utopians worked out ways of circumventing that and breaking that system. 
and it goes on every time the companies find a new way of prohibiting this uh, technological people come in and find a new way of breaking it um, and Mason argues in the long run it gets more t costs more to protect something than it costs to actually produce it and when you get to that point you know it's like buying a buying a lock for your bike and the lock ends up costing more than your bike there's no point really having that bike is it you're just making locks so it gets to the point where we spend so much money to protect things that it just becomes cheaper to make them free so post-capitalism is kind of emerging out of this kind of problem it's, it's ongoing now you can see it all around you the problems are occurring companies are failing to deal with them uh, so post-capitalism emerging but we don't know what it is until it is already the new normal. We won't recognise it as a new system until it's actually upon us. So Mason also draws on Castells. Um, already old capitalist power relations are being threatened by network relations as I mentioned earlier. Hierarchical systems are being challenged by horizontal systems. Capitalism cannot help but generate networks. That's inherent to the nature of capitalism. And new kinds of production are already in existence. Uh, and they're networked and mediated. So we end up with new kinds in this post-capitalist world. Um, we end up with cooperatives. So there's an organisation called Mondragon, which is a, a worldwide, it's a Spanish organisation, but it's got workers all around the world. And they do peer-to-peer -peer production. So it's a little bit like Wikipedia. You engage in the production of something um, on a peer-to-peer -peer basis. People who don't know each other collaborate to make something new and they each get a little bit of that share uh, so it's it's an idea of a network permeating this we've got the idea of credit unions rising again and these by no means are not a new idea credit unions have been going you know for at least 150 years the credit union is a non-commercial bank it's a way in which you can have you can have a credit union and it's a, a kind of thing it's, it's run but it's not run for profit you can store your money in there you'll get a bit of interest but the money you store in a credit union is lent to other people and there's no shareholders there's no non well everyone who has money in a credit union is a shareholder of the credit union uh, there's no third party coming in just raking off the profits you've got other forms of informal economies emerging you've got um, people start trading in things so you've got the idea of time banks so what you do you go into a time bank so this, this image on there the circle is a time bank um, and what you do I don't know say I'm a hairdresser I offer one hour of my time in a hairdresser's and I put one hour of my time you know I, I allow someone to come and take one hour of my time and I'll cut hair for that period of time I've now got one unit in the time bank I could then trade that for a gardener to come to me and do my gardening for an hour or something else or you can trade them around for different e each hour of time has a currency and you can swap your hours of time for various other services there's no direct money involved you've also got things like bitcoin which is a, a financial systems a financial um, a currency that isn't based in a particular country it only exists on the internet I'm not going to go into Bitcoin now, but it's a new way of thinking about money itself. You've also got not-for-profit enterprises, organisations that exist not just to make money, but they seek to do things that will benefit others. So there's a picture here of what's called the Edinburgh Remakery, but there's lots of non-profits out there. But this particular one, uh, the Edinburgh Remakery, it's got people in there, and what they do, they teach you how to repair things. And if you bring something in, they'll teach you how to repair it. So you've got old electricians in there, you've got people who can do upholstery, you've got plumbers, and they'll show you how to repair things. And you give them a gift, you give them something old, they show you, you know, how to repair it, or they keep it in a shop, and they sell it. And that money of the repaired good is then paying for the shop. So it's a different way of thinking about finances. They're not there to make a profit, they're there just to exist and to expand the skillways in the area. And there's also a strong environmental criterion here as well. So they're trying to reduce the amount of things that go into landfill. Okay, so Mason's short-term future. Uh, he sees the future uh, in the next few years as financialization and economic crisis. The, these kind of problems are identified with the digital economy, with the idea of the uh, productivity, are going to get more and more exacerbated. 
um, there will be privatisation and erosion of public services. The public sector will work less and less, and more and more vital services will be privatised. You already see GS4 working in prisons. They will take over various forms of it under the current political system. You will see an increase in the core periphery workforces, uh, a proliferation of zero hours contract, a mass underemployment. That's not just unemployment, but it's people who want to work more, but it's, they can't get more hours. There's also unemployment as well. Actually, sorry, I've got two underemployments. One meant to be unemployment. You get larger numbers of people unemployed. Also, symptoms of climate change are growing and spreading. And also, we grow in conflict and social tensions, but not necessarily along the old class lines. We've already seen the impact that Brexit's having on the way in which British society operates. There's been far more racial attacks, far more nationalist agendas spoken in the in UK since the uh, Brexit uh, event. So new class divisions will spring up, or new divides on different lines will spring up. But what Mason says, there is hope. Networks and post-capitalism will generate new kinds of protest, opposition and innovations. And these are going to be led by people like you. Cohorts of new media and digital workers. People that understand digital media and understand digitality will slowly start, as they come into the economy, they will start shifting things. And slowly Mason thinks it's possible that a new digital post-capitalist mode of production will emerge. And if you think back to our early discussions of Marx, when we talked about the underlying system, the underlying economic system, well, post-capitalism is what um, Mason is talking about as an exon. And this will be characterised by cooperative network relations and much less emphasis on price or profit relations. Well, that's, the, that's the upside. Or, on the other hand, it might all go horribly wrong. Now, at the moment, it seems like the network capitalism has produced Brexit, it's produced Trump, it's produced other things. Maybe Mason's wrong. Maybe that is the future. So, thank you very much. Just if you want to have a look at some more readings, read the Fitzpatrick reading in the reading pack to explore the criticisms of Castells. So I hope you've enjoyed this lecture and I hope you've learned something from it. Thank you very much.